Yeah, and I'm excited to have this conversation. I mean, I'm on both sides. I, I love having this conversation. I'm passionate about this conversation. But also at the same time, my heart aches at the amount of work we still are yet to do about ending child marriage and teenage pregnancies. I'm certain that if you are living in this country of ours, you already know what is happening on the ground. Sometimes it could be your neighbor, sometimes it's part of the family and it's all around. But how do we end the scourge on child marriage, especially as well on teenage pregnancy? Well, there are definitely organizations that are spearheading uh, some of these projects and works. And we're here with uh, the team from Plan International. Uh, we have with us Honorable Afidra. Uh, I said that correctly this time. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Olema Ronald, who is the chairperson of a Uganda Parliamentary Forum uh, to end child marriage and teenage pregnancy, as well as a member of parliament, uh, Loa Madi Okolo, right? Yes. Uh, and as well as a patient, uh, Kemgisha, who is a youth advocate, a technical advisor, influencing and communicating uh, and communication rather for Plan International Uganda. And as well as uh, Mastula uh, Nakandi, who's a girls and young women advocate for Plan International. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I believe that this is very uh, important conversation. Uh, and uh, we cannot stop having this conversation because these things uh, are still happening especially when we're talking about child marriage, teenage pregnancies. Um, but first, let's just start and talk about Plan International. Give us an overview. Uh, perhaps you will give us an overview and tell us what is uh, Plan International? What do you do? And uh, what kind of work have you been up to? Please, patience. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you. So Plan, we are a dual mandate organization. We work in both development contexts and humanitarian settings, that is the refugee response program in Uganda. Currently we are in about 13 districts. We work in East Central Uganda, we work in West Nile, that's where our refugee response program is. We also work in Kampala, we have a program for safe and inclusive cities. And we also work in Northern Uganda, that is uh, Lira, Aliptong and the other districts. And uh, our work in all those areas focuses on about three key areas. That is under education, which is a program we call LEARN. And then we also have a program on health, broadly it's health, but with a focus on sexual and reproductive health. And then uh, we also have uh, cross-cutting issues like Thrive, which is uh, economic empowerment. So we have a holistic approach to the uh, different areas that we work in but most importantly we work to, we advance children's rights and uh, young people's rights that's broadly what plan is about well, it sounds uh, like you have a lot of work to do all around in different places yes. uh, which is good work but let me bring you in here uh, Afidra as uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what is happening when you're talking uh, child marriage what is the scope, really, uh, when we're speaking about teenage pregnancy? Uh, what is happening on the ground in Uganda? Thank you. Um, this country is so unique. It is divided into the different regions. Mm -hmm. We have both urban and rural. Mm -hmm. And as far as teenage pregnancy and child marriage is concerned, the statistics in this country are skewed towards the rurals. I'll cite an example. Kabarole district. In the new vision of 3rd of June, page 10, the Directorate of Health Services in that district indicated that close to 2,172 teenagers got pregnant in the year 2022. Mm -hmm. Earlier on in 2021, about 700. In my own district where plan works in West Nile, I come from Madiokolo district, especially after the end of the COVID pandemic or when the COVID pandemic was in, we saw as a country many more of our children, especially the girl child, before the age of 18 getting pregnant. What in our view where this couch coming out from. Mm. The fact remains that it is a problem across this country and it is increasing. The earlier on statistics indicated that the, 
the rate of child marriage and teenage pregnancy stood at 24%. And over the years, this has not reduced significantly. Oh. Actually, it has reduced by 1%. Mm -hmm. Now, if this couch or the problem is significant in this country, we as leaders, we need to do an intervention to address this specific uh, challenge that is facing our country. Aware that we have the legal framework for marriage. Mm -hmm. The Constitution puts it at 18 years and above. Mm. The Marriage Act stipulates that for you to give your child the daughter in marriage should be at the age of 18 and above. But we've seen in this country a girl child mm. getting married mm. even at the age of 14. Yeah, true. Some are at the age of 13. So this should tickle any leader. Mm. This should have impact or a cause for any person who is genuine Ugandan mm. that subjecting a girl child to early marriage mm -hmm. definitely leads to some causes. On the girl child, on our economy, on our family, it's the ripple effect Absolutely. that affects a girl child, especially mm -hmm. when it goes early into marriage. So I want to agree that it is a big, big issue in this country. Absolutely. That's why even in parliament, mm. we decided to form a very specific parliamentary forum. At legislative level, that's why the speaker of parliament has come on board to be the patron of this specific forum. Mm. Why is it so? If we're seeing 24% of our girls going into early marriage, you know 24% means out of every 10 Girl children, uh, girls. Yes. Three of them are being married off. Are being married off. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, the numbers are definitely a little scary. Um, but for those who are watching and probably don't know, uh, who would blame the girls themselves and say it is their fault? Um, let me bring you in, ladies. Let's talk about the main factors, perhaps, that are contributing to not only teenage pregnancies but also uh, these young girls being married off early. What do you think are some of these causes that this is actually happening? Start it off with you, Mastula. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would say uh, the causes of teenage pregnancy are very complex, uh, right from the traditional culture norms where we come from, mm -hmm. the different tribes that we have in Uganda, but also we look at the re uh, religious practices that some of them promote early marriages. All those are things that uh, perpetuate and make, uh, that are making sure that we have an increase of child marriage and teenage pregnancy within our communities. But also let's look at poverty. Mm. Uh, when we go into our families, for example, the girls and young women that are living in slum communities where most of the people cannot afford to even eat two meals per day, mm. most of those situations force girls and young women to maybe think that if they get into marriage, they can maybe find ways of finding something to eat and maybe having where to sleep because also those are challenges. But also let's talk about the communities where we come from. Mm. For example, I come from Katwe and most of the people you see within our communities that are role models are also within marriages and those people are young people. Mm. So when you come from a community that you don't see anything different, automatically that is something that you're going to be doing. And within our communities we have leaders, we have police, but you find most of the time no one condemns early marriages mm -hmm. and no one condemns teenage pregnancy. Mm. That is why they are on the rise. We have laws, we have policies, we have everything. Mm. But when you go uh, down to the ground within Katwe, within rural communities, for example in Bujiri, those laws, those policies are not really known by the community and even the police and even the leaders mm. do not really get to understand that there are laws that protect girls and young women, mm. that there are laws that are supposed to be there for girls and young women in case a girl is forced into early marriages. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all those situations continue to make sure that we have increasing uh, numbers of teenage pregnancy and early marriages, but also the education. Uh, I would say we have the universal primary education in Uganda and the USE, universal secondary education. But then you find that still parents that are uh, 
uh, within poor settlements have to still pay money to ensure that their children are able to access education. But imagine a scenario, a parent who cannot afford rent or food to eat, can they afford education for most of the children that, that they have? Mm. And most of those families have children who are more than five. Mm. And making sure that each and every one of them goes to school. And remember, we have gender stereotypes within our communities that say, if even if you educate a girl child, she's going to end up getting married. So why bother? Maybe focus on the boy child, but not remembering that girls and young women are also human beings and they have their rights. Mm. So all those things limit girls and young women and they also contribute to the increasing number of teenage pregnancy and early marriages within the country. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess this is the sad reality of what is happening on the ground. Patients, if I may ask you, where, when you're looking at the places where you work at and the areas where you go, um, how does this uh, child marriage, teenage pregnancy, how does this actually affect the young girls uh, that you work with? What are some of those things that you're seeing uh, in their lives, how does it affect them? I think the very first one, which is very obvious, is how being a young mother will stop you from achieving your dreams. You'll not reach your full potential as long as you have a child. And it's not even when we say teenage pregnancy, we are re restricting it to 13 to 19. But then we have seen districts in Busoga, like Kamudi, where we work, where 10 years, 13, below below like the nine years and it's normalized within the communities mm. so you ask yourself if a district like Kamudi in 2022 reported 6,034 cases of teenage pregnancies that means nine months later you're going to have about 12,000 young people children children taking care of children so I think for me it's like a ripple effect so you, you can look at if at 13 she's having a child, she's not going to reach her full potential. She's going to have a hard time going back to school. She's, not, she's going to be cut off from making money because at, at, at 13 you're really still a child. Mm. Even when you're having a baby, you're still a child. Mm. And then you have another child that you'll be unable to take care of. So for me, the biggest thing is looking at how much of their dreams are cut short. Mm. And when we look at it, we look at the root cause. Where is it coming from? She talked about the social norms, which is a very good point, but not all social norms are actually contributing yeah. to child marriages. There are those that are harmful. Mm -hmm. There are those where our parents in, in the rural areas are still looking at girls as sources of income. So you ask yourself, if my parent looks at me and sees money, value, sees money in me, then the question is, how does that parent then support this child to reach their full potential mm -hmm. if when they look at them, they see a source of income. Yeah. So for me, and, and most of them do not attain education. And you know, in Uganda, the system is built in a way that girls are only able to achieve something if they go to school. Go to school. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if they are unable to go to school, if they are unable to take care of themselves and their families, mm -hmm. and their parents are failing them, then we have a very big problem. Mm -hmm. Well, then that brings me to the question of uh, what are some of the strategies that could be applied, uh, especially for you, Honorable, uh, how can government, as well as uh, different organizations like PLAN, for instance, uh, work together uh, and collaborate and address this matter when we're talking teenage pregnancy and child marriage? Uh, what are some of those strategies that have already been applied that could also be applied in order to end this? Um, as parliament, our role is to make laws, and I want to agree uh, with our advocate here that uh, Uganda has got good sufficient laws. Mm -hmm. The question of teenage pregnancy and early marriage is about implementation of the law. So as a country and as government, I want to urge government that awareness about the existence of the law to the law enforcers needs to be done. So that within a community we should be able to the law enforcer should be able to know the problems and the challenges of this girl child who comes to the offices or reporting that they are being raped or defiled or abused by any community member. Mm -hmm. So if awareness is created within the law enforcers, they can be able to enforce the law. The second thing is, in my view and my opinion, there are some interventions which as a country, 
we need to critically look into the health interventions. I know it has a cultural issue. And I don't think as a country, as a parliament, we can, because of our cultural differences, we can begin to subject our girls to early, um, you call them the ways of preventing mm. um, pregnancies. Mm -hmm. As a country, we cannot, because our ethics does not, we rather about. promote yes. abstinence. Okay. That's as a country. So I know there are some family planning methods that some scopes of our society would like to advocate for, so that this scourge on teenage pregnancy and early child marriages can be reduced. But that needs to be addressed carefully because it has some cultural norms. Mm. The other issue is, as a country, we have a strategy. The country has developed a strategy to end teenage pregnancy and early child marriages. It is running from 2023 to 20, um, 27. Okay. The strategy outlines some key interventions that both as a government we need to achieve in order to reduce the scourge from 24% to 15%. Mm. There are strategic interventions both at legislative level, at implementation level by the different arms of government, but of course by our development partners like the plan and any other to address together. This goes back to our culture. I want to agree with you that some of our cultural interventions that are within the strategy needs to be communicated to uh, different traditions and the cultures that if some of these cultures are promoting teenage pregnancies and early child marriages, then those cultures need to be reversed mm. or needs to be addressed carefully so that the intended impact of our strategy can be achieved. Mm. There are so many, other, uh, so many other interventions that are within the strategy. So I know we have a policy reform. Laws have been made within the strategy. We have awareness creation. And then, of course, uh, some family planning interventions, which we need caution about. Mm -hmm. So those are some of them in, within the strategy. Absolutely. Well, I mean, these strategies no doubt work to some extent. And uh, you spoke about uh, law enforcement and them being able to implement the laws. What happens, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm certain that, ladies, you can tell me of a story where the law enforcers themselves are involved in uh, either child, some form of child marriage or causing a teenage pregnancy or defilement in some kind of way. How do you, as Plan International, um, actually deal with things like that when the law enforcement that's supposed to be helping is not helping at all? Um, and also at the same time, dealing with the cultural norms. In my opinion, I would call them abnormalities. Um, I recently met a young lady who's 25 and has already had her fifth child at 25, which says to me she started very, very early. But that was normal for that particular community. So how do you uh, address those issues when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to the elders in the community, uh, culturally speaking? How do you address them? Let's start with you, Patience. All right. So uh, culturally speaking, in most of the areas that we work with, like West Nile, we have um, an MOU with the Alur Kingdom. Now, before we engaged the kingdom, the, the marriage ceremony used to take seven days. So people would come to your family to take just one girl, and then they would be within your compound for about seven days to just pick one girl. And then when we made a social norm research study, we realized that when the family of the man comes for the marriage ceremony, then there are other girls who become victims, which is now how the child marriages are coming in, especially mm -hmm. in that part of the country. So what our MOU has done, our involvement with uh, these cultural uh, institutions is at least those seven days at least in West Nile have been reduced to three days so now a traditional marriage ceremony in West Nile in the Alur Kingdom takes about three days but this has come as a result of engaging the power centers the people because when you're tackling uh, things to do with culture mm -hmm. you you will not go as planned you need the custodians of the culture to relay the message to the people that is how it works mm -hmm. so we are working with also the Busoga Kingdom in eastern Uganda to see how do we create culturally acceptable interventions that tackle teenage pregnancies and child marriages and um, 
coincidentally, we have very high levels in those two in West Nile and Busoga. They are in the top two across the country. If the national average is 22%, it is 28% in, in eastern Uganda. Mm -hmm. It's slightly higher when you go to West Nile. So on that level, that's what we have done with the cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. But also, we recognize that access to sexual reproductive health information is very key because we need to be able to give the young people a choice. They need to have the information. Some of them are becoming pregnant because they don't know what to do. They do not know how to have self sex. Mm -hmm. So we give them access to information. We are in talks with the health centers to see how do we make um, adolescent friendly services at health centers for the young people that could be victims of uh, sexual reproductive health. Absolutely. But also remembering that we talked about poverty as a root cause. Mm. And then we also have programs on economic empowerment, but we also go ahead and have community dialogues. Like we said, we said some parents are looking at us as sources of income, then how do you deal with that? Mm. So we have intergenerational dialogues within the community to sensitize the parents and tell them, look, this is a child and not a source of income, and then we give them alternatives, acceptable alternatives to say, you can do this to give you money other than looking at me as a what? As so a, source a source of, of income. income. So those are some of the things that we do. But most importantly, is building like the agency of young people, mm. like Mastula here, for them to be able to speak for themselves, to say no when they are being made victims. Because if the victim cannot speak out for themselves, then almost the work that we are doing is, is being buried Absolutely. under. So, the most important aspect of our work is for the young people who are victims to be able to speak, to put them in spaces like this even, to take them to parliament, to take them at every level of influence, for them to say, look, we are being affected and we need to be helped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mastula, let me bring you in as well to just perhaps share the success stories because we can sit here and talk about the grim reality of what we are facing. But there are also some success stories. There are some uh, young girls who have been helped, young girls who have gone back to school after uh, uh, you know, being married off early, uh, teenage pregnancy. What are some perhaps success stories that you might know of uh, that you could share with us? Uh, thank you so much. And as you've said, they're success stories. And within our work as girls and young women, for us, we try to make sure that we are role models mm -hmm. of other girls and young women, especially within our localities, for example, the slum communities. But I also have girls and young women that come from uh, rural communities. We try to make sure that we continuously mentor our fellow girls and young women that cannot maybe access platforms, like for example where I am, I go back, I try to make sure that they are aware of their rights, and also we continue to encourage our parents and guardians within our meetings that we have to ensure that they continue to send girls and young women to school, but also help them realize the potential girls and young women have, Absolutely. because girls can be doctors, girls can be lawyers, girls can be anything they want to be. True. So for us, our role is continuously mentoring, empowering, and being role models, but also continuously making sure that we do advocacy on every platform that we get to have, for example, social media, right now where I am, but also using other forms, engaging with our leaders, right from the local level to the national level where we have the members of parliament. Uh, but also we've seen within our communities that if girls and young women have sustainable support systems within our communities, we are not talking of one-off events that are there, for example, to celebrate the day of the girl child, mm -hmm. but we are talking about support systems that can be there where girls and young women can run to in case they have issues, in case they have uh, facing domestic violence within the homes. So those support systems can be able to mentor and support girls and young women. I'll give an example of myself yes, as a success story. Uh, within my community and within my family, I, I wasn't able to go back to school within the right time because of school fees challenges. But because there were some community-based organizations that were working with, with PLAN, I was given an opportunity to be mentored, to be supported, to also be able to utilize other opportunities that exist within our communities. For, ex for example, the skilling opportunities. If a girl is not able to return to school, are there any other opportunities that exist within our community that can support those girls and young women? And for me, I was mentored. I was helped to realize that even if I've not 
been given a chance to go back to school within the right time, but I can still be able to do other things that are useful, mm -hmm. not to go into early marriage or go into prostitution, because those are some of the things that are within our community. So if girls and young women have those support systems within our communities that can hold their hand, that can support them, that can give them advice and other alternatives, I think we will be able maybe to put an end to child marriage and also teenage pregnancy because as of right now, there is no way you can tell me that I can get married right now because yeah. I realize I have big dreams and I mm. realize I can contribute to the development of my country. Mm. So if we are able to build girls like me within Uganda, I think we'll be able to put an end to teenage marriage uh, and early pregnancy. Absolutely. Yeah. You're a beautiful Thank example you. of uh, the work that you guys are up to. Uh, Honorable, let me bring you in. Any final thoughts on uh, how, not just how we can tackle this, or just final thoughts on child ending child marriage as well as teenage pregnancy? Thank you. Um, we need girls growing up to be girls, not girls growing up to be mothers. Mm -hmm. A girl cannot be a mother before 18. Mm -hmm. I do not anticipate what is it there in a girl that men wants to subject our young girls to. So absolutely as a country, final thoughts I would say is one, the country has allocated some resources to, it's called the GROW project. Yes. The GROW project has close to 900 billion dedicated to the, to the women. During the State of the Nation address in the evening, I had an opportunity to be called as a guest of honor to the Good Leisure Farm that got some girls, both refugees, some women or ladies, both refugees and nationals, about 152. Mario Kolo was a beneficiary of that. 30 of them were actually girls. Wow. Some came with their children and they were given skilling. So part of my thought is through the GROW project and the partners, we need equally to skill these girls who might have left the opportunity of education. The two fundamental causes in my view of um, teenage pregnancy, one is education. Mm -hmm. The other one is poverty. So to break the circle, we need the girls to be given education opportunity. That might have been ruined because of early pregnancy or early marriage but still that opportunity exists. I remember after the COVID, government came up with a law that even though girls were pregnated during the COVID lockdown, they should go back to school. And indeed that helped. As we talk, there are so many more who conceived, even one of my cousins mm -hmm. in my house conceived, and because the law became friendly by Ministry of Education, she's now in senior five, but the child is about three years old. So giving opportunities to the girl child, you will educate our nation. Never ever should we really undermine the potential of any girl. We can't subject them to early pregnancies, even early marriages. Our cultural norms, we must review them to fit the current situation that we are in. Government is doing a part, but the family needs to do a part. And the community, the society needs to to a bat so that we can be able to grow together as a nation and beautiful girls and ladies like you that people are seeing can come out from the girl child that we're striving for. Well, I'll tell you what, I uh, get inspired when I speak to men who are spearheading the cause for young girls because uh, it's not enough men who are speaking up uh, when it comes to the things that young girls are going through. Girls are speaking for themselves, but really, truly, the men need to stand up and really speak for their daughters, their sisters. I have three daughters, mm -hmm. all girls. I couldn't see them at age of 14 getting pregnant. I married at a later age. Mm -hmm. So my first daughter being 15 and senior two, that this being pregnant and having, Sounds it shouldn't happen in Uganda mm -hmm. today. I want real echo and call on the rest of the Ugandans, whether you're a cultural leader, whether you're a policymaker, whether you are a border border, whether you're what, mm -hmm. we have a call for action to protect our girls, mm -hmm. that let them grow to be girls, not girls to become mothers in this country. I agree. Couldn't say better. Patience, any final thoughts for you? Yes. Um, a plan is currently running a campaign 
which is running under the hashtag, the future that girls want. So for me, I think that is my vision, to see how do we work together with government, with the, the several players, because you see the problem of child marriage is, has different faces. It is multifaceted, so it requires that same level of engagement at different levels, right from the community to the national level. So how do we then work together? He talked about the guidelines that the Ministry of Education put in place for prevention and management of teenage pregnancies in school settings. And what those guidelines were saying were the other bit that has been hard to implement is allowing girls who have given birth to be at school with their babies. Can I be in class from 8 to 9 and then step out for 15 minutes to breastfeed? That has been very hard. Sure. So we are working very hard. And those are some of the things that we ignore that are actually preventing the victims of teenage pregnancies from going back to school. So how do we as a nation, from wherever you are seated, from the power that you have, how do you work together to influence from wherever you are to say, how do we then bring these girls within the community? Mm -hmm. So for me, my final call to action is for all of us in our different capacities. We all have the power to do something. As you could see from where the problem is coming from, we have the laws at the national level, but we also have the issues at the, in the communities. So can we all come together, do our part to make sure we realize the future that girls want? Absolutely. Oh, very well said. I think that this is a, one of those conversations that we can have all day if we could. So many things that we could talk about. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Honorable Afidra, patience as well as Mashila for joining us on this breakfast meeting. Keep doing the work that you are doing because it is absolutely important. And if you are watching and you are a community leader or even a parent, a sister, a brother, how about you watch out for your neighbor, watch out for the young girls. And it, it, it only takes you, actually. Nobody else. It only takes you. You can do the work. You can make a change. And it really is our responsibility. Uh, for me, Victoria Sabia, thank you so much for watching the breakfast meeting. Until next time, goodbye and God bless.